You are listening to Mining Stock Education, where you'll learn from the top leaders in the natural resource sector and uncover quality mining investment opportunities. This is Brian Lenny of Mining Stock Education and JuniorStockReview.com. Uh, today with me, I have John uh, Capaglia of CEO of Spread Asset Management. Um, to start, I think it would be really helpful, John, if you could give us a background on yourself and you know how you ended up at Sprott. Yeah, great. Great to connect, Brian. Nice to meet you. Um, well, it's been, uh, I, I hate to date myself, but um, I've been in the investment uh, management business since 1993. So I think next year I'm coming up to a milestone uh, anniversary. So I've been, I've had the um, the good fortune to be in a, in a really great dynamic industry for a very long time. And it's, uh, there's always something new to learn. And, and that's what kind of, I think, uh, makes me tick. So I've been um, at Sprott for about 12 years now, I believe. And, um, we, you know, we focus almost exclusively on all things metals and mining. So I'm not an engineer or, you know, I don't have a technical background, but I'm very uh, intellectually curious about um, all things related to mining and then and uh, whatnot. So I, I find it's a good mix to, to marry uh, the interest in in uh, in metals and mining commodities and and and, and capital markets. Very good. Um, you know, Sprott is a leader in basically all things related to the resource market. But today, I wanted to focus the attention on the uranium market. You know, it's really captured investors' attention over the last probably year and a half, at least. And you know, uranium prices performed really well over that time period. You know, today sitting around fifty dollars per pound. Um, I think one of the good pieces of news that we saw over this last year was the Japanese uh, announcing that they would restart their fleet of nuclear reactors. In your view, are we seeing the effect of the Japanese restarts now, or is this something more that's going to happen over the next period of time? Yeah, I uh, I, I just think it's 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 um, it's clearly a, a, a whole number of different announcements and developments that we've seen in the sector over the last, you know, 12 months that have really brought a lot of attention back to the sector. And, you know, quite frankly, two years ago, if you try to talk to somebody about uranium or nuclear energy, I, I guarantee you, you wouldn't even be able to get a, a meeting. And, and that has obviously changed enormously in a very short period of time. And I think the you know, investors that are interested in this category are clearly connecting the dots and they're connecting the dots around two very powerful catalysts that we think are going to fuel this current uranium bull market that is underway. And those are really uh, energy transition. So all of the net zero commitments that have been made around the world by governments, they've all acknowledged that they will not get there on the back of renewable energy. Um, they need to have nuclear as part of the mix because you can load as much uh, renewable energy as you want on your grid. And, and, and all you do is add more uh, unstable in intermittent sources of energy. And, and the only way you're going to offset those issues uh, are three ways. You can have a coal fired power plant. You could have a natural gas uh, fired power plant or you could have a nuclear power plant. So, so pick one or, or all three. The reality is you, you need to have a backup power source. And that's where nuclear kind of fits in because it doesn't produce any greenhouse gases. And it's the perfect complement to all the renewables that we've put on our grid globally. Uh, so that's thing one. So as we try to decarbonize our economies and our grids, and we try to electrify more and more things, you need more reliable, affordable baseload power. So that's kind of the first part of the thesis. The second part of the thesis is is really um, come about, unfortunately, because of events uh, that commenced on February 24th of this year, and that's the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. And that really opened up everyone's eyes to this something that uh, we haven't had to worry about for a very long time, and that is energy security. Uh, and that's having secure, reliable sources of energy or and or a secure, reliable kind of uh, or predictable prices for, for energy. And uh, everything is obviously thrown out of kilter when a key supplier to energy markets uh, is disrupted. And you're seeing that in spades in terms of the natural gas market and the coal market and the oil markets, particularly in Europe and Asia, that are dependent on other countries. So all of a sudden, if you think about... If you think about a country um, 
who can I pick here? If I if I think about a country like Finland, who just uh, opened a very large nuclear power plant uh, this year, uh, 1600 megawatts, I believe, you can imagine the sigh of relief they're breathing right now, not having to be beholden to trying to source natural gas or coal, like Germany is basically doing, scrambling around, pushing the price uh, up, uh, at, you know, at times over the last over the last six or seven months, pushing it up to astronomical levels. Also, by the way, forcing that that price point uh, on the rest of the world because they're basically squeezing out all the rest of the world uh, in a, an effort to fill up their storage tanks. So think about all the developing markets that are basically throwing up their arms and saying, you know, we can't we can't pay that price point for LNG or, or coal or whatever. So it's how it's having a a tremendous ripple effect across energy markets across the world, uh, which can obviously destabilize uh, governments, economies, create social unrest. Um, and so when you combine this energy transition uh, idea with this energy security thesis and you put them together and, and then you layer in the supply demand fundamentals of uranium and you say, you know, it's a critical mineral that's only growing in demand, yet we still have a structural supply deficit because of the previous bear market, how are we possibly going to close the gap and and ensure we've got you know supply of uranium for all the growing number of, of, of nuclear reactors? There's only one way to solve that. You need more production and more production will come in time uh, only at higher prices. And that's the thesis that investors, uh, I think, universally have, have bought into. Okay, those you bring up some really good points. Um, so, but I wanted to start with. So, we, you talked about first about the you know the reliability of, of baseload power produced by nuclear power plants, and you know me, I'm an engineer uh, from background. It makes a ton of sense to me, um, and I think the thesis is is pretty clear. But when you look at the reactors being built worldwide. I don't know, eighty percent, ninety percent of them are in the east, or in in China, in Asia. So why? Is there such a discrepancy when you look at the number one electric uh, or electric producing and consuming country in the world, the U.S., and I don't see any new reactors being built? Um, I, I'm not sure what the best question to ask is, is what do you think is preventing them or what do you think might be the catalyst for them to, to say, hey, you know what? You're right. Baseload power needs to come from nuclear. Yeah, it's a, it's a really great question. Um, the, the reality is, is many country, countries in the West uh, turn their backs on nuclear power, um, whether it was post Fukushima in 2011 or even earlier than that. <clears throat> and so as a result, many of the power plants in the Western countries, you know, were built in the 1970s, were built in the 1980s. And then we had this big drop off in terms of uh, the rate in, in terms of new plants being added. There is a there is a new plant in Georgia, believe it or not, that's being fueled right now. So that's that's one of the the few new um, bills that um, is finally being completed after lengthy delays. Uh, so it's interesting. So the West basically turned their backs on nuclear power. And there was really two reasons for that. One, there was um, lack of political will and there was lack of public support uh, after Fukushima. People got nervous about the safety of nuclear energy. But then there was also two other contributing um Factors And people have to think about energy in, in, in a wider context. One, we had uh, the shale boom that created a uh, an abundance of very cheap natural gas. So the world pivoted uh, or many parts of the world pivoted to very cheap natural gas. Uh, unfortunately, that's over now. We don't have we don't have this boom of, of, of cheap natural gas available anymore. And then the second part was this massive multi trillion dollar build out of renewables, either solar uh, predominantly solar and wind with some hydroelectric. And as the cost of you know solar panels and, and wind uh, came down, more and more governments supported those. They got tons and tons of in investments, incentives, tax credits, carbon credits, you name it, you know, fixed price contracts. Every incentive that you could possibly think about was given to renewables over the last 30 years. That's been a good thing, obviously, to decarbonize. But as I mentioned in my earlier comment, what it's also done is destabilize many grids because of intermittency and also weather events. And so as governments have kind of realized that there is no there is no alternative, um, you know, you can't just you just can't build out uh, endless renewables without having this alternative baseload power. Um, it really has forced governments to say, 
we need to have a different think about nuclear energy. And it's happening around the world. You know, I, we will look at Japan and say, hey, they're finally announcing restarts. What was the catalyst for that after many, many years of foot dragging? Well, it was probably natural, you know, LNG prices hitting $60, $60 a million BTU in the summer. Um, but it's the reality that, you know, you're, a, you're not a resource rich country. And how are you going to, you know, how are you going to deliver power? I mean, you and I live in the province of Ontario, uh, which uh, I think is, 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 is often pointed uh, as a one of the leading the, the leading I guess case studies of a of a place that has been very pro nuclear energy unlike many other parts uh, in the world and right now I mean you and I uh, enjoy a power grid that sixty percent of it comes from nuclear energy it's very reliable yes energy prices are going up here too but nothing like they they have experienced in other parts of the world so. I think our government here has done a masterful job of um, committing and refurbishing a lot of our plants, uh, which produce plentiful uh, baseload uh, power to back up our other forms of energy, which are largely hydroelectric and and, um, and wind. Okay, so if if I if I understand you correctly, to to you, it's just a matter of time, like before you know governments in the West are forced, or maybe not forced, but see the the light into what nuclear power could bring to their the stability of their grids is that correct it's it's underway okay. um, if if you just want to look at the last six months um i'll just you know zip around the map and and, and just share a few um the uk government um uh, just recently announced its first investment in a new, a new nuclear power plant in 30 years so how does that all of a sudden happen the first time in 30 years they're making i think 800 million pound investment in uh, size well a uh, new a new a new build uh we talked about japan wanting to turn on more reactors by next summer um uh K- south korea previous regime was essentially winding down its nuclear they were trying to phase it out new new party comes into power and it's like stop we're doing the opposite we're expanding we want we, you know they're a key um they're a key key nuclear um, energy developer in the world. They want to export their technology and build more power plants. Uh, Poland is a great example, you know, almost in- entirely dependent on coal for their power. They just announced they want to build for the very first time up to six new re- nuclear reactors. Um, Belgium, obviously um, having impacts from, from natural gas. They just announced life extensions for a number of their plants. The Netherlands, they just announced they'll be building new nuclear pl- power plants for the first time in years. Uh, the Philippines, Indonesia, looking at nuclear power for the very first time. Um, so it's 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 all it's happening all over the place. And and you know, close to home, uh, Pickering, the Pickering power plant, which is not too far from where where I am right now, and it, it just got announced it will be extended. It was slated to close in the United States, Diablo Canyon, California. Uh, the very last power plant was it was was destined to close in 2025. They just received a billion dollar funding from the state of California to continue operating to at least 2030. And I wouldn't be surprised if it goes well beyond that. So all of these energy policy U-turns, as, as we're we're calling them, I think are very powerful. Um, it's we think there this is very similar to what happened in the in the 1970s when. We had another energy crisis that you probably remember, because um, I sure do. Um, and that was when OPEC got a, got a hold of the oil price and squeezed it. And all of a sudden, government said, hey, we can't be beholden to this country or this region for our energy needs. We need to be more self-sufficient. That was a catalyst that led to many of the power plants being built in the 1970s and 80s, nuclear power plants, that is, that are still operating today and have been producing uh, zero greenhouse gas emission uh, power for the last 50 odd years. So we think a similar development is happening right now. The catalyst, unfortunately, is Russia. It's the price of natural gas. It's the price of coal. Um, and it's just the reality that we're, we seem to be moving away from globalization. You know, globalization has been a wonderful phenomena over the last 30 odd years. You know, as, as, um, you know, since the Berlin Wall came down, and the Soviet Union came apart and we've moved more and more to globalization. It's been a huge beneficiary in terms of 
people coming out of poverty, standard of living, life expectancy increasing around the world, the amount of energy usage that we've had. So these are all been very positive and it works really well when everybody's friends, but when it's disrupted and we've seen what, what, what can happen in a very short period of time, the whole balance uh, in the system is, is thrown off and it can make energy markets go kind of haywire, which, we, which we've seen uh, since February 24th. Absolutely. Great points. Um, and so the second point that you brought up in that first question was, you know, Russia and, you know, the effect of the Russian Ukraine conflict and kind of how this is spilled over into, you know, all aspects of our life, not just energy. Um, so kind of on that same topic, um, with that conflict, not really seeming like it's going to end anytime soon. Um, do you think the influence of, you know, this, it's sort of East versus West changes the, the, probably the Iranian market? uh in any way you like you know kazakhstan where it's located um the kazataprom is the largest producer worldwide i think last year was around 24 percent of the world production was out of kazakhstan you know obviously because of proximity you know naturally i think not maybe not just me but other people might think hey you know there might be a relationship between the russians and kazataprom to some degree or maybe this there's influence there um how do you see that sort of security supply changing the dynamic uh in the world as as we do see kind of east and west sort of splitting in a way yeah, I think there's for the uranium markets specifically, there's two major issues that utilities and market participants have been following and, and thinking about for the first time ever. Um, and that is one, um, uh, let's start with Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan is actually a very big producer, closer to 50% when you add in all the, all the JV partners that they have as well. So there is, you know, a single country in the world that produces 50 up to upwards of 50% of a critical fuel that, that generates 10% of the world's electricity. So whenever you have that kind of um, reliance on any one region or country, it, you know, it's just more susceptible to, to any kind of a uh, disruption. So that's thing one. And I think, you know, the Kazakhs have, have done a pretty good job trying to balance, um, you know, the, the dual interests of, of not upsetting Russia and, and not upsetting the West, West, which are key customers for many of the resources. The bigger issue, and I think the the, the one that, that that has had a more dramatic impact this year is clearly on the elements of the nuclear fuel supply chain that Russia Russia does play a material part of. And those are the conversion of uranium, so the conversion of U-308 to UF-6, and then basically the enrichment of uranium, uranium uh, <clears throat> up to, you know, reactor level um, uh, requirements. So Russia is not a big producer of, of natural uranium. Most of that actually comes from uh, JVs that they have in Kazakhstan. Um, so going back to conversion and, and, and enrichment markets, Russia controls somewhere around 25 percent of the global capacity for conversion and almost 40% of the, of the global capacity for enrichment. And the reason for that is because when prices for those services collapsed in the bear market, we essentially offshored many of those services from the West to Russia. So utilities use them for, for, for those uh, services. We essentially either shut or curtailed a lot of those facilities in the West. So, you know, the facility that's in, metropolis illinois that honeywell operates it's been closed since 2017 that's a conversion facility for uranium it's going to be reopening next year but you know these plants um, are very complicated you, you just don't uh flick a couple switches and after being off for five or six years they take time to ramp back up um and other facilities in the west around enrichment have been either curtailed or, or closed over the over the last decade and so what's happening now is um, the West needs to essentially reshore some of those services, but it's going to take several years to do that because, as I said, it will take time and significant investment to build capacity uh, up in the West as well. Those facilities are not going to just build up capacity and spend huge amount of, of CapEx dollars unless there's also uh, long-term contracts underpinning those investments. So that all has to happen. Um, 
One thing I should mention is there are absolutely no sanctions against Russian uranium or Russian conversion or Russian enrichment. There are no issues transporting Kazakh uranium by rail to St. Petersburg for, for shipment to other places in the world. There are no sanctions. And the reason why there are no sanctions is simply because there are no, there are no alternative uh, sources for those services available today. And yes, there are, you know, a couple of bills working through um, uh, U.S. Congress to, to basically either cut off those services or to uh, transition away. But the reality is they've gone really nowhere because there's no plan B. Now, if you look at the prices for both conversion and enriched uranium, they've gone up sharply this year, somewhere between 50 and 100 percent plus respectively. So those two parts of the uranium fuel cycle have seen big impacts this year because of this disruption. But as I said, it's going to take several years to actually implement that trend, tra- that transition away from, from, from Russia. Excellent points. Um, question about the long-term contracts. What is considered long-term in terms of uranium contracting? Like, are we talking three to five years? Is this 10 years? Like, what is a a long-term contract look like? Yeah. I mean, the, the thing about the uranium market is, um, it's a, it's, it's the polar opposite of, let's say, of a just in time market. Um, you know, when you think about, when you think about running a natural gas plant, um, you're talking about having to source fuel every day through a pipeline or a tank. Um, it's, it's very vulnerable to these kind of short term shocks. When you think about uranium, um, how the utilities procure it is often on very long contracts. So you will see a utility come to a producer and often say, okay, I need, I need you to deliver me, you know, a million pounds per year starting in 2026 and going every year to 2032. So they basically will procure for very long periods of time so that they never get caught short. Um, Utilities will often hold two or even longer years of inventory in different forms uh, of, of uranium moving through the fuel cycle to ensure that they never get caught short. And so this is one of the, the other beautiful things about running a nuclear power plant is it's just less susceptible to these supply shocks that you see in that gas and, and coal. Um, so as they work down their inventories, they obviously have to come back and procure more so that they've always got this pipeline of material working through the different stages of the fuel cycle. But it really does mitigate those kind of risks to short term disruptions. Um, we're seeing utilities um, contracting in, in ever greater amounts. We think 2022 will probably be the highest year for contracting of utility since since 2011. So utilities are clearly drawing down un, uh, inventories. They're clearly seeing the price of uranium go from kind of the high 20s per pound to you know around $50 a pound right now. We did hit $63 a pound in the spring when we thought there could be sanctions against Russia. But I think longer term, what the utilities are responding to is greater concern about security of supply, the structural supply deficit we're seeing. Um, and they're also they're also feeling better about their operations. Let's face it, if you're a utility right now, you're making a ton of money um, generating electricity around the world. Um, you're also getting a lot more support from different governments and policies and, and financial incentives to keep your power plant running for longer. Um, so there, you know, with this renewed confidence that these plants are going to be operating for longer, you need to go back to the market and, and procure. So we're seeing utilities procure. They're obviously very focused on the parts of the fuel chain that are most at risk, uh, which Russia touches, uh, as I mentioned, uh, in, 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 in a greater way than in versus natural uranium production. Okay. Um, go, using kind of like a real world example, uh, it's a question that I've, I, I still haven't heard the answer for in terms of the Japanese. You know, after Fukushima, they shut down their, their fleet of reactors, yet they did, I would suspect, would have had long-term contracts in place for uh, uranium. So in a situation like that, would they have been able to get out of a deal like that? Or is, is that uranium still exist in Japan? Um, like is, did that supply just get cut off from those contracts or is it, are they going to be able to feed on what they've had to contract over whatever term they had left? 
Well, yeah, it's a great question. Um, I think I think the reality is is that um, you know when we were going through this structural supply deficit in the market the last few years, part of that gap we suspect was being backfilled by Japanese utilities selling some of their excess inventory uh, back into the market, or they could have been loaning it. Um, you know, the reality is it's taken a very long time to get these restarts, and 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 so you. As a utility, you're carrying this material, um, you know, on your on your books, and you know, do do you want to just carry it in perpetuity, or do you want to try to monetize some of it? So, we think some of that um, selling into the market or lending in the in the market will definitely dissipate as utilities start to think, okay, there's a chance here, or I am scheduled to to restart. Um, we have heard, we had, we have heard little bits of news that. Uh, producers have been, you know, re-engaging with Japanese utilities to talk about their long-term fuel needs. So we think that's a very positive uh, point. That one, if if material is not is no longer coming to the market that was purchased under previous contracts, and two, they actually might start to procure more uh, uranium for the future. I think both of those things are are very positive. But again, as I mentioned, it's it's a very slow moving market because it's the polar opposite of, of a just in time market. But I think um, I think it is a positive development. I, I think uh, it'll it'll take time to play out. Um, but I think the Japanese seem pretty committed after a very long hiatus to, to get more reactors back online. Oh, definitely. Um, you touched on it earlier, uh, or I. Th- I- the small modular reactors and specifically to Ontario in, in the region where we live. Um, mm-hmm. I think it was a billion dollar uh, investment by the government on small modular reactors. And to me, like the reading that I've done on that SMRs, it seems like that could actually be a way that we, you know, speed up the process towards, you know, nuclear um, power being a bigger part of our grid. Um, in terms of SMRs being accepted worldwide, it, it, I guess it's two questions is, do you think that's the way that that the world is going to go towards these small margin reactors? And, and second, um, do you think that 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 is the way that we can speed up the process of adoption? Yeah, I'm, pr- I'm pretty excited about the SMRs. And, um, you know, just speaking about um, the Darlington plant in Ontario, they just they just broke ground, actually, uh, for that investment. Um, I, so I think it's really exciting because, you know, the bugaboo with the big reactors is they've been largely over budget and over over scheduled um, in the West. Now, places, you know, in the Middle East and China have been able to build large scale nuclear reactors on time and on budget. So I don't know why, why we struggle, but I think that's part and parcel of just about every large infrastructure project we we seem to do in the West. They seem to be way over budget and, and, and delayed. But, you know, I think places like China, India, uh, the Middle East, they're going to continue to build, you know, 1,000 megawatt type reactors um, because they've got huge metropolises to, 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 to power. Uh, in other parts of the world, I think the SMR technology is going to be more applicable because, the, the wonderful thing about the SMRs, um, you know, in concept, because we're still in the development phase, is one, um, building building it uh, in a controlled environment should be more, uh, uh, less expensive and it should be more efficient, you know, and then assembling them on site. But I think the, the more interesting applications, just their scale is just so much smaller, meaning you can, you can, um, you can implement these in uh, a much, uh, you know, wider range of locations, meaning, you know, when you think about powering a city of, of 5 million people, yeah, having a large scale reactor is perfect. But if, you, if you're talking about a smaller city of, let's say, a few hundred thousand people, well, you don't need that kind of capacity. This is where, you know, a 200 or 300 megawatt reactor might work really well. The other thing is that we have thousands of coal fired power plants in the world that at some point are going to come to end of life. And that could be 20 years from now or 30 years from now. And then the question comes, well, what are you going to do with those locations? Well, you've got, you've got an existing, you've got an existing workforce there. You've got an existing, uh, you know, requirement for power. You've got transmission infrastructure, you know, this concept of what if you repurpose that site, um, you know, 
refurbish it to be a, a to host a small modular reactor as the coal part of the plant you know hit, hits its end of life keep those people employed retrain them create more construction jobs so it's kind of a win-win because you know i think people don't don't realize that you just can't turn off you know all of these legacy fossil fuel plants without creating all kinds of disruption you know instability to the grid also instability to these communities you, you close a power plant that that might employ five or six hundred people they're all out of work and then what happens to the town it basically dies so if you're a small town in wyoming or wherever you're you know you're very interested in this technology because it might it might you know meet a whole bunch of objectives uh decarbonize your economy keep your grid going keep these jobs in place etc cetera, etc cetera. So you're seeing places like the state of Wyoming, I think, um, be very progressive here in terms of uh, working with with uh, developers of small modular reactors to to do t- test cases where they're they're going to basically in the next ten years convert existing coal infrastructure plants to SMRs. And I, I'm watching this this kind of development very carefully because, as I said, there are thousands of potential locations around the world. To do this conversion if you think about trying to build anything and i don't care if it's a wind farm a solar farm you know hydro nuclear power plant nat gas plant think about the think about the process to get local buy-in the permitting the approvals i mean it can take it can take a decade so if you if you think about these existing locations which are already hosting a site already have local jobs already have transmission lines etc cetera, etc cetera. think about how much faster that approval process could happen with these smrs so as a result you're seeing canada support this you're seeing you're seeing france wanting to support their industry the uk so you've got you know companies like rolls royce and ge and atachi that are basically building these in terra power and new scale and so yeah it's a bit of a race right now amongst different developers to get uh, regulatory approval you know and commercialization but i think this is this is this is going to be a huge part of the transition over the next 20 odd years we're probably you know somewhere between six and ten years out for many of these deployments but i think i think the the main point here is it's happening um and i think it it, it will have a, a it has the potential to be very meaningful over the next 10 to 20 years. Great points. Um, so the uranium price has been strong. It's around $50 per pound. Uh, in my view, it's just probably not enough to incentivize new production or new mines to be to be made. You know, we probably still have a little ways to go. With, with that in mind and be on the cusp of a new year, what are the points to look at, um, you think, for investors in 2023 into gauging the health of the uranium market? Yeah, well, 2022 has been a complete roller coaster. Um, and it's been a roller coaster because I, I would say in part because of, of um, the war in Ukraine and, and all the uncertainty that brought in the, in the first part of the year. But I would say the roller coaster has been predominantly um, driven by the tightening of monetary policy globally. That has clearly had a massive impact on uh, real estate markets, bond markets, currency markets, stock markets, commodity markets. It has had a profound impact on just about everything. And even though the, the fundamentals for uranium and nuclear power have never looked better in probably 10 plus years, the price of uranium has kind of been stalled the last few months. We've been just kind of meandering around $50 a pound. You know, and a lot of our investors have called us and said, hey, what's going on? Like, there's so much good news. There's all these positive developments. You know, why can't the price break out of this this kind of range? And uh, yeah, we find it equally as frustrating for sure. Um, I think it's just really driven by this risk off sentiment. There is so much capital sitting on the sidelines right now. We've talked to, I've probably talked to 150 different financial institutions and, and family offices in the last three months. And the overriding sentiment is we just don't like markets. Not that we don't like uranium markets or nuclear energy. It's just we do not like the investing environment right now. And we just don't want to do anything. And in that backdrop, um, it's just like, don't fed, don't fight the Fed. You know, if the Fed is going to continue to raise interest rates, 
um, and put pressure on on just about every market that we see. It's just they just do not want to to participate. So I think for 2023, I you know it has nothing to do with uranium or nuclear energy. I think the number one uh, issue to work through is getting the Fed um, getting getting clear signals from the Fed that it's slowing down or pausing its tightening cycle. I think that is the signal everyone is waiting for across just about every market in the world. With respect to nuclear energy, I think we're going to see more and more positive announcements in terms of you know life extensions for existing reactors, you know more countries signing MOUs um, for, for new builds, et cetera, more countries saying and signaling, hey, we're, we're looking at nuclear energy for the first time. I, I think that's just going to keep building. I really do. I, I think that this wake-up call that the world has had in terms of the, the vulnerability of not just fossil fuel markets um, for energy production, but also the, the intermittency, the growing acknowledgement that the intermittency of renewables uh, is a bigger problem than I think everybody anticipated, just points to more support uh, and incentives for for nuclear energy to to to, uh, to be a, a, a key part of the energy mix. Um, I do think once once sentiment improves, I think capital will start coming back to the sector. I think that will clearly uh, have an immediate effect because these markets are not very big. Uh, they can move very quickly when we do see investor interest in capital flowing again. Um, so you know, look, at the end of the day. Um, I think we're all a little bit frustrated that the, the 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 rally is kind of stalled, but you know, at the end of the day, the fundamentals um, keep reassuring us that uh, everything is, is still lined up very nicely for this for, for this bull market that we think is still very early. And the reason why we think that is because fifty dollars is a price that you know clearly allows a tier one producer like Cameco to restart a mine that's been on care and maintenance since 2018, but it does not uh, provide any incentive whatsoever for a number of other deposits around the world that have either been on care and maintenance um, or have to still be built. And so, yes, we've seen some mines announce restarts, uh, whether they're in Africa, Canada, uh, Australia. Uh, The U.S. is going to be expanding uh, uranium production for the very first time in, in many, many years, but it's still a drop in the bucket in terms of meeting local needs. The, the big issue is what do we do in five, five to eight years or 10 years from now when a lot of these mines that are producing today get to end of life? Where are the new mines of tomorrow? They're not going to be built at $50 a pound. Uh, that is a really big issue that, you know, if I was a utility, I'd be thinking about. Um so the mines of tomorrow that that have basically been stalled for the greater part of the last 10 years uh, need to be built. They need to be built in the next, um, let's call it two to six years. And they need to to uh, to fill the gap. And it's not going to be at $50. Our guess is it's going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of, depending on grade and jurisdiction, somewhere between $70 to $100 a pound. Um, we, we think that's a realistic price range depending on where your deposit is and and uh, uh, how difficult will, difficult it will be, be to build a, a, a new mine. Very good. Uh, Sprott's home to some of the top mines in the resource sector. And, uh, you know, in my view, the product offerings are tops in the business. Can you give us an overview of Sprott's funds and services for interested investors? Yeah. So Sprott um, essentially has two uranium uh, related offerings. Um, the the largest is Sprott Physical Uranium Trust that trades on the Toronto Stock Exchange in both U.S. and Canadian dollars. It also trades in the U.S. on the OTC market. Um, that fund is just shy of $3 billion. It holds 100% physical uranium, um, very popular with institutional investors around the world. And then our, sec- our second offering, and, and it's the newer of the two, is our uranium mining ETF. It trades on the New York Stock Exchange. And that fund tracks an index that essentially holds a basket of the top producers. So Cameco, Kazatomprom, the top developers. So these are the companies that are in environmental permitting right now, uh, trying to build the mines of tomorrow, things like NextGen and Denison. And then there's a whole plethora of, of, of earlier stage uh, producers and 
developers and explorers. And then finally, you get a couple of vehicles, um, including the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust, uh, within the index to give you some exposure to the physical commodity itself. So it's it's kind of a diversified approach. Uh, these individual companies are still, many of them are very small cap. Um, they're very volatile because they're pre-development. Um, and so if you don't want to do the work on trying to pick, pick you know, trying to pick the winners uh, amongst these, uh, uh, you know, exploration companies, many investors just say, hey, I'll just buy a whole basket of them. And play the theme that way. So we've got the, these two vehicles. I, I think the two vehicles uh, position Sprout is probably one of the largest um, providers of uranium related investments in the world. So um, we've become a very meaningful player in a very short period of time. Um, and we're, we're, you know, we're very interested in this space. We uh, we've even launched a clone version of the uranium mining ETF for investors in Europe. So they can buy, that fund uh, through our partner in the UK uh, on the UK exchange, the um, Italian exchange and, and, and the German stock exchange. So we've been trying to you know, broaden our reach because what we have found is that interest in uranium is not uh, North American centric, it is very global. Uh, we find pockets of investors right around the world. Oh, very good. And one last thing, um, it, it, the name, it doesn't include uranium, but I know you guys are doing updates on it. The Sprott Gold Talk Radio podcast. Um, I've seen a number of updates uh, that you guys have done through that podcast. How can people um, subscribe or where can they find that podcast? Yeah, well, you can, you know, you can go to your favorite podcast host like Apple or, or Spotify or whatever. I think I think we also um, post them on our website. So Sprout.com, you can go to the insights section and you can see those podcasts. Um, they've been really popular. Um, we talk about, you know, precious metals markets. We're talking about uranium markets. And I and I will tell you that in 2023, we're going to be talking a whole lot more about energy transition materials. So those are materials that we believe are going to be very important for everything from increased electrification to electric vehicles, battery metals. Um, so we'll be talking about more and more metals in 2023. Excellent. John, it was a pleasure. Uh, thank you for the conversation. Thanks for having me. 